Hi, my name is Rick Hedgman, and today we're going to be talking to you about matrix diagrams and uh, the nominal group technique. And we're going to talk about those a bit separately, but we're going to connect them via an example. So there are a lot of different types of matrix diagrams that we use in decision making. These are not matrices in the mathematical sense. Uh, so we're not thinking about them in that way. These are matrices that are intended to find relationships or to uh, to represent relationships among different factors. We have the, by far and away the most common type of matrix diagram is called the L-shaped matrix. It will have rows, it will have columns. And the only intention is to find relationships among the elements in the row factor and the elements of the column factor. So again, that is far and away the most common matrix diagram relating two traits one to the other. We have a T-shaped that will be let's say three factors, A, B, and C, where each of those factors has some number of elements that could differ by, by the fact or by the trait. So A might have five elements, B six elements, and, and C might have three elements, for example. But we're able to find relationships between, let's say, um, A with B and C with B, but not the other relationship. You'll see that when I show you the, what the matrix looks like. An X-shaped matrix looks at uh, four different factors that may or may not have the same number of elements or categories each. And we can find relationships, let's say, uh, between four two-way relationships, but there are two two-way relationships that we won't be able to look at directly. A Y-shaped matrix looks at three factors in a little bit different way, but it enables you to look at the relationships um, A with B, B with C, uh, a with C, so all of those relationships. And then there's a so-called C or cubic shaped one. And that allows you not only to look at the two-way relationships of uh, two factors, one with the other, uh, and all of those, but also at the three-way relationship, A with B with C simultaneously. But I've, I will have to tell you that I have never seen a C-shaped one used in practice. I've never seen a Y-shaped one used in practice. So this is just a, a cover graphic that I composed where you might have, let's say, four uh, factors, A, B, C, D, and they might be something like the roles of individuals, the responsibilities of those individuals, the resources that can be dedicated, and the requirements. Um, just as a matter of fact, that would be called an X-shaped matrix, by the way, where you are able to look at the two relationships of, or the four relationships of A with B, B with C, C with D, and D with A. On the other hand, we couldn't look at the remaining two. Uh, we couldn't look, for example, at A with C or D with B. So here's the L-shaped matrix. Two traits. As an example, let's say roles and responsibilities. Let's call those traits A and B. And A would have some number of categories um, or, or uh, elements to it. Those would be the rows. B would have some number of categories, those would be the columns. And what we would try and do would be to populate the cells in that table. Now, ordinarily, we'll populate uh, cells in the tables of any of these matrices very simply, which is to say that we will either leave a cell blank, and we would do that if there was no relationship between the particular category of A and the corresponding category of, of B for that cell. We would then look at three levels of relationship other than the no relationship. A weak relationship, a moderate relationship, and a strong relationship. The symbols that we use to represent those, we will not initially use numbers, although it's typical that we will later add numbers. For a no relationship, we would ordinarily use a zero. For a weak relationship, a one. For a moderate relationship, a three. And for a strong relationship, a nine. The reason for that scale is to be able to introduce some amount of separation among factors. There's an example of T-shaped matrix where you can relate A with B and B with C, or A with C, where A is uh, stretched up and down. Okay, so just some simple graphic representations of an X-shaped A Y-shaped matrix where you can look at A with B, B with C, and A with C, all of the, the two-way relationships and a cubic where I try to use that ABC in uh, black print in the white box 
to tell you that we could kind of be out there in three-dimensional space and represent that. But again, I've never seen that used in practice. Okay, so L-shaped matrix, it is the most common. It's not always the matrix of choice, but it is by far the most common. Evaluation, typically a simple graphical scheme, uh, only three levels represented, weak, moderate, strong, and then a blank for no relationship. What we're going to show you is how this might be used in conjunction with the nominal group technique. So what is the nominal group technique? It is a group decision-making tool. And it allows you to see, for example, whether or not there's generally reasonable agreement among group members, if there's somebody who's an outlier with the remainder of the group members, or if there's a lot of contention within the group. But procedurally, the steps that you would go through in nominal group technique would be as described on this slide, that first you would identify what it is that you're trying to, uh, to assess. The idea that you brainstorm, whatever it is you want to prioritize, whatever the case may be, how you want to uh, divide your resources, whatever the case may be. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. What we would do is we would generate the list of issues, the problems, the solutions, whatever it is that you are going to prioritize. We would write those things out on a flip chart or on a board. The key thing is to have those in a visible location where all members of the group can easily see them. We would, before we ever start the nominal group technique real process, we would clarify the meanings uh, behind those. If there were duplicates, we would eliminate duplicates. And then whatever the final list of, of statements or issues were, we would write those down again in a visible place on a flip chart, on a white erase board or something like that. And then what we would do is let's, let's suppose there are six of those. We would um, identify those as A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay, let's use letters to represent those. So if we had six, A through F. And then what would happen is that what you would be doing as a team member is you would be rating those now, one through six. Whichever one you think is most important, you would give the six to. Next most important, the five. Next most important, the four. Least important, the one. No ties allowed. No ties allowed. You make a decision, which is most important, which is next most important, etc., which is least important. And then you combine the rankings of all team members. Let's see how that sorts out. So just as a very simple example, let's suppose that we have a team that's looking at five different issues, A through E. The team members are Juan, Erica, and Kareem. Uh, when Juan looked at those issues, A through E, he felt that B was most important, hence he gave B a five. C was next most important, a four. E next most important, a three. D next most important, a two. And A the least important, a one. Erica, you can see her ratings. A five for E, a one for A. Kareem, his ratings. A five for B, a one for D. Okay, add those up for each of those elements, A through E, and you can see that for A, they add up to four, for B, 14. C10, D5, E12. Now, some people, some teams might be able to stop right there. And they might be able to just say, okay, it looks like uh, B, E, and C are relatively similar. They have higher rankings. A and D are definitely down at the bottom of the pile. But what other people might do is something like any one of the following columns. I would ordinarily go out to the very rightmost column that says adjusted weight. So here's what we do. Add up all of those, the 4, 14, 10, 5, and 12. They add up to 45. That means that A got 4 out of the 45 as, uh, as a ratio. So 4 out of the 45. <clears throat> now let's suppose that we were distributing 10 points, 10 points, 20 points, 100 points, 50 points. You get to decide. I would take that ratio and multiply it by the 10 or the 20, or the 50, or the 100, whatever it is that we decided to, to uh, divvy out, to allocate. So if it was 10, 445 times 10 is approximately 0.9. Okay, I would round that then to 1. For B, 1445 times 10 is about 3.1. I'd round that to 3. That's the adjusted weight. 
there are a lot of different places that you could stop in this process depending on who you are as a team. But generally, I go all the way out and get random ones. And then with this, I'd end up saying, oh, you know what? Looks like if we're going to prioritize, we will put uh, the greatest weight on B and E. C is in the middle. And A and D are the last things, the lowest priority. So let's see an example now where we can combine the nominal group technique with the L-shaped matrix. This is based on a real, uh, a real example. The names have been changed to protect the guilty and the innocent. And what we're trying to do is select a senior leader. I can tell you that this, uh, again, was very real. We had a failed search for a senior leader someplace else that I previously worked. The first time around, we had 300 applicants. Uh, the search failed. The second time around, we had 100 applicants, exactly, which we were quickly able to get down to a smaller list. They were required to submit materials, let's say um, their resume and maybe a cover letter and maybe a few other things. So 100 candidates, they've each submitted a common set of materials. And based on a, an evaluation of that common set of materials, we were able to quickly get down to nine individuals. So those nine individuals, again, names changed. Anaya, Bates, Karun, Deng, Egan, Gates, Levine, Miles, and Ruiz. And so the next stage that we put them through, these are the people that we have nine out of 100. We've narrowed it down to these nine. Of those nine, each was asked a question, three questions. Let's suppose that we were expecting written responses on these three questions. So notice that the questions have different weights, three, two, and five. Again, this was a team that was evaluating responses on these questions. The team used the nominal group technique to weight the questions three, two, and five. In other words, question three was the most important, three the next, or question one the next most important, question two the least important. Okay. Notice the symbolic representations that you see in the table where you have either a, a sad face, a happy face, or a neutral face. Very simple. You get to pick the symbols, but we pick something very simple. Now, for the smiley face, uh, you can't probably can't see. You're probably seeing my face down in the lower corner of, uh, of the screen. And it's covering that up, but exceeds expectation. We would now assign a 9 to, meets expectations of 3, below expectations of 1. Notice for Anaya, Anaya had a total number of points over there in the rightmost column of 90. How did we get to the 90? The answer is we took question one, Anaya exceeded expectations in his response or her response, and the weight was three, so three times nine. Question two, exceeded, response, uh, exceeded expectations two times nine. Question three, exceeded expectations five times nine. So you have 3 times 9 plus 2 times 9 plus 5 times 9. That adds up to 90. Bates, you see Bates was 60, and you can do the math on the others to verify that those numbers are accurate. Now, there are some comments worth making, one of which is that in this particular example, when you have ex exceeds expectations, you better identify, one, what the expectations are, two, what exceeds expectations looks like, three, what meets those expectations, and four, what below expectations looks like. And part of the reason that you want to do that, and particularly in something like uh, human resource management or a hiring practice or something like that, is you want to protect the process and the people in it. You want to make sure it's a fair process, but you are trying to make yourself bulletproof. And if you don't have those things uh, very clearly determined as to what meets expectations, exceeds expectations, and so on, you will not be successful in that. It makes your, your process one that's more easily challenged if you're not careful in that regard. Okay, so we have at this point all of the initial material that the 100 applicants submitted. We use those to get down to the nine. Now, these nine individuals probably did not come into this phase in equal standing. That is, there was probably a pretty clear idea about the 
who we thought were the top two or three or four at this point and who we thought were the bottom two, three or four among these nine people. They come out of the stage and you can see some separation. In particular, you see that um, Caron and Egan and at the bottom Ruiz, that those three clearly were scoring much lower than the others. Okay. So what would you do? Well, what you might do at this point is since you're trying to get to the best hire, you might eliminate those three people from consideration okay. and not move them forward. On the other hand, you may have very good reasons for moving uh, these people forward. For example, I can tell you that in one case, uh, one of those bottom three was a female who we felt had not had the opportunity to show everything that she was capable of doing in her environment. So we kept her in the process longer, feeling that if we gave her a chance that maybe um, maybe that would be revealed, that in fact uh, she would be the perfect person to hire, let's say. Okay, so next, next stage, you see that we went further. We had a telephone conversation with the candidates who remained in the process. Uh, down at the bottom, you can see Ruiz. Ruiz had been dropped from the process at that point, or had possibly dropped out uh, him or herself. So for the matrix diagram telephone conversation, we had five questions each of the candidates were asked. Again, you see differential weights, 31312, and those were determined using nominal group technique. Real questions, real weights, real rankings that you're seeing, only the names are changed. So Anaya, Anaya again looked good, 72. Uh, Deng, who looked very good the first time, even better this time, 84, and so on. And again, you see some separation though. For example, Caron uh, had a 30, Egan had a 30. Ruiz had already dropped out. Caron and Egan were the two who were low in the prior round. So notice that we are accumulating information as we go. It is never about only the most recent phase of information. It is always about the accumulation. So, so far what we've had is we've had the initial materials they submitted. We had their written response to some questions. We now have the telephone conversation answers to some other questions. There's another phase beyond that. <coughs> Excuse me, so let's say another phase. You saw stage one, stage two. There was a third stage, which I don't have the slide uh, to show you, but I can tell you that we evaluated like this. Stage one, you saw those results. Remember that Naya had the 90. Stage two, remember that Naya had the 72. In the third stage, which you don't see, Naya had an 84. We weighted the stages. This probably won't surprise you that we built up the importance as we went. And so stage one, the written responses, um, using nominal group technique got a weight of two, stage two got a weighting of three, stage three got a weighting of five. So Anaya, how did we get that 816 total sitting out in the rightmost column? 90 times two is 180 from the written response stage. From the telephone conversation stage, 72 times the weight of three is 216 more. And from stage three, whatever that was, 84 points times the weight of five, that's 420 more, 180 plus 216 plus 420 adds to 816. And when you put those together, <coughs> what you'll see for all of the candidates is that there, you started to see the separation. Caron was gone, Egan was gone, Ruiz was gone. Among the remaining six candidates, you had Anaya with the 816, you had Deng with 666, and if you recognize that number, that pretty much describes how that candidate turned out to be once uh, they were in a live interview. Gates 582, Levine 548, Bates was pretty low at four, uh, or at 366, and there was one other that you don't see for Miles, and it looks like Miles was, let's see, 440. So we looked at a total of, I believe, four of these people to see what happened. I can tell you that the candidate with 816, false name being Anaya, got drunk on the interview and had some other problems. 
666, that person was hired. Now, that person was hired but proved to be a disaster with a lot of problems subsequent. Um, the one with 582, the one with 582 assumed a similar position elsewhere and excelled, utterly excelled. And then the one with 548 we felt like showed uh, a breach of ethics during the on-site interview process. So that if you look at this, uh, there were reasons why the committee felt that the best candidate to move forward actually turned out to be 666. Uh, false name being Ding. Okay. Now, the charge of the committee was not to give all of this information to the person responsible for hiring. The charge of the committee was to summarize strengths of what that person wanted, what the uh, person responsible for the hiring wanted, was to have a summary of strengths and weaknesses of each candidate of each of the people that uh, had the live interviews. And of course, we're able to do that. And with your comments, you can easily enough convey your thoughts anyway. Uh, even without numbers, you can convey more or less the same information. So I can, I can tell you that um, I like the process that was used. Uh, the ultimate result wasn't the best result, but that didn't show up until much later. So this would be an example of using the nominal group technique in conjunction with L-shaped matrices. So the, what you see in the body of the table, the white, that's the L-shaped matrix, just as it was in the prior couple of slides. So here you've had an example of matrix diagrams, a nominal group technique, matrix diagrams, the purpose being to find relationships among uh, factors or traits, and nominal group technique, the purpose behind that being to uh, arrive at group consensus or to use as a group decision-making tool. So thanks very much, and we'll see you again for some other topic.